Um, first, um, we'll have Chad Post, then Elizabeth Harris, then Jeff Brock, and then um, Diana Thau will, will finish up. So, um, Chad. Um, hey. Yeah. Do I need to introduce you? No. Um, everyone knows who Chad Post is. He publishes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> That's true. <laughs> probably at Alta, right? Um, publisher of Open Letter um, runs Three Percent, the database, and so has a whole bunch of data for us on Italian translation. Yeah, I'll just tell you the story. I haven't done this, um, looked at this report in a while since we were in Turin, whenever that was, um, for their book fair. But I'll tell you the story and try and give you some of this information. It'll contextualize everything that you guys will talk about, hopefully, because it's very data specific. Um, about in 2008, at Open Letter, we run this website called 3% that a lot of you probably are familiar with. That's like a blog and review site. And <clears throat> at some point in time, I started keeping track because there's there's always a debate on like how many books are published in translation in America and what is where does three percent number come from? There's different people have come up with ways of saying why or that the that there are only three percent of the books published in America are in translation, but they never know what books they are. There's no like actual granular data, so I decided that we could try and do this. Um, so starting in 2008, I created a database that tracks every original work of fiction and poetry published in the U.S. for the first time ever. So no retranslations, nothing that was out of that fell out of, fell out of print and then came back into print. I was only looking for the first time this work was available to English readers. So we'd be looking at like the new, what new voices are accessible to to people who read English. And I kept track of, we keep track of still to this day, the title, the author, the translator, the country of origin for the author, where they're born, what language it was written in, the pub year and month, the price, um, who, if there are any other translators that are involved, and now we keep track of whether or not the author is male or female, and if the translator is male or female. <laughs> so we have an endless amount of data, essentially. It's not endless, but it's, it's a lot. So a lot of the figures that you'll see get referenced by like the New York Times or in various articles will say, like, well, according to the 3% database, 540 books were published in translation last year. And that's all coming from this, this thing that we've been keeping track of. And that, actually, I think 540 is the right number for 2014. Um, and we put it, put it all online. You can download it. It's easily accessible. Well, about two summers ago, the Italian Trade Commission, which is uh, includes Italian books in the book office, I guess they call themselves, something to that effect. They, um, and they're charged with trying to promote Italian literature. And they called me and the woman's like, well, since Italian literature doesn't get translated at all, we need, we need you to do a report in which you analyze this and break it down and show just how many Italian books are getting translated, how many of them are funded, um, all this information so we can go to the government and say we need more money to be able to improve the, the translation of Italian literature into English. So I went back and she wanted it for specifically 2012 through 2014, so those three years, and wanted to include children's books and nonfiction as well. So I spent a lot of time going back and adding in children's books and nonfiction to get to this. Okay, now first off, um, where am I here? Okay. Um, there is actually, I did my first ever PowerPoint for this report, but I'm not putting it up there because I think there's something, I did think, no, I did something wrong. I can't remember what the mistake is right now, but I know the last time I showed it, I was like, oh shit, that's like, that doesn't add up. Um, <laughs> so we're going to ignore that, but um, otherwise I would be able to show this to you. I can email it to you if you want. There's a whole long report with like 25 spreadsheets that explain all this. Um, we'll start here with just the overview of Italian books. So in those three years, there are 174 books translated from Italian and published in the U.S., which isn't a terrible number, to be honest. Um, it's much like you said, it's higher than most other. It's the third highest, as you'll see in a second, the third highest country in terms of translation. So it's not bad. However, um, just to break this down, too, of those 174 books, half of them are fiction. Um, 62 were nonfiction, 14 were poetry. So the poetry was very small in contrast to even the nonfiction. Um, let's see where I'm gonna go here. There's, um, there's so much data in this, man. There's like, I've got it broken down as like the how, for fiction it's been pretty much the same. There's like 67 books, 62 books, 45 in 2014, that changed, this is out of date. Um, but there's pretty stable. Um, the thing that was most interesting to me about just looking at Italian and not comparing it to other countries yet, just focusing just on Italian, was that the publishers bringing this out, and this is what you were mentioning right before, Owen, are, are that there's only a handful that are doing a significant number of Italian books. 
Um, and that handful of publishers in no way corresponds to the publishers that are doing the most translations in America. This will become clear in a second. Okay, so over the past three years of this three-year period, 81 different publishers brought out at least one book from Italian. So that's a, that's a significant amount. The ones that are the top were Europa Editions to 24, University of Chicago 10, FSG 9, Verso 7, Chelsea Editions 5, which was most of the poetry then, Penguin 5, Other Press 4, Pushkin Press 4, and Rizzoli 4. Okay, um, that's which is is interesting. Um, the skip that, skip that. Okay, so compared to the rest of the world, here is where this gets this starts to get more and more interesting. So between over that three year period, there are two thousand essentially two thousand four hundred books published in translation, and Italian made up one hundred and seventy four of those. So it's not a great ratio, but to put that in context. French had 539 books, German had 385, Spanish 253, then Italian with 174, then Japanese with 105. So they're still in the top when you look at it just by language um, in the top five, and, but like one third of the number of books of, of French and half of the number of books translate from German. So compared to their counter, with, when they commissioned me to do this report, they're essentially like, well, our counterparts are France and Germany, we need to know why we're not doing as well as France and Germany. So in, in contrast, in that, in that light, Italy looks really bad. Like they're, they're not even close to the number that, that are coming up from France and German, or from French and German um, writers. But you know, there's a, there's a, when you look at this, it's like when you look at all the other countries, there's like 100 countries on here that have like two books that came out over that three year period. So you know, <laughs> a grain of salt. Um, OK, so then this is the part where I was referring to you before. Over that three-year period, here are the presses, I'm just going to name them, the presses that have published the most translations. Delkey Archive, Amazon Crossing, Europa Editions, Seagull, FSG, Other Press, North-South, because this includes children's books, Yale University Press, New Directions, and Columbia. Those 10 presses brought out 482 works in translation over this three-year period. Okay, so they're, count, they're, count, they're counting for a sixth of all of the translations that came out were from these 10 presses. Those 10 presses published a total of 41 books from Italian, and 24 of those were by Europa Editions. So you eliminate Europa Editions, and it's down to, is it 17? 17 from the other nine largest presses doing translations in America. And this is the thing that I thought was most interesting was that it just, it, it's such a weird situation that the, there's a lot of publishers doing Italian, but they're not the ones that are generally doing a lot of other translations, which seems to be some sort of weird disconnect that's happening there. Um, that we can talk about later too. Um, there's a lot more information in here. I think the other thing that was, was worthwhile was that of the 70, 174 books, only 26 were subsidized for the translation, which is a very small percentage. And a lot of my, the conversations that came out after this, I'll just tell you about that part and answer any numbers questions you guys might have later after everyone else speaks. But we had a, um, in meeting with the Italian government and doing this whole report and talking to them about it, um, there are a couple things that came clear. One is that Italy does have a translation grant program, but the website doesn't work. Um, the information is not distributed to any publishers. The publishers I talked to, the vast majority did not know that there was a grant support available. So, and, and that does play some role in what gets through because there, it is useful for a lot of these presses to know that there's some, so, some sort of funding to help offset the translation costs or promotion costs, which Italy has but no one knows about. Um, they also like they wanted it because because they wanted to be compared to Germany and France, which is like not a great idea um, because they they do things much more smoothly. Um, both France and Germany have systems by which they promote X number of books a year. So like there's the New Books from German magazine that comes out quarterly, I believe, that highlights ten books from recent publications in Germany. This gets sent out to like probably 300 different publishers or editors. It has information in there about how to apply for translation funding. It has information about other programs that they have, all of that. The French granting program, um, uh, it, they didn't have on, they didn't have their information all online, but they have like a series of things in which they have French voices that they help fund and support books, the Hemingway grants. There were almost more Hemingway grants in one year than there were um, grants for Italian translations over this three year period. And that's only a portion of the French support. So I talked to them and made a whole proposal in which we would do essentially like a 10 books from Italy publication twice a year that would be like a PDF that could be sent out that would have all this information in it and the government said that they couldn't find the money for it so everything sort of they got to the point of like 
here's all the information on, on what's wrong and how to try and address that, and then it stopped. <laughs> so that's part of the reason, I think, for this, the jam that we're going to talk about. So I'll just look, turn it over now to you, Liz. Yeah, that's great. Nobody's surprised. Yeah, nobody's surprised. <laughs> yeah. The title is so great of the panel, <laughs> the traffic jam. What is the, when you said the, um, uh, and what is the, the resource for translators? What, what is that site called? It is. I have a whole report on it in here. And I can tell you. Let me just open it, it up. It isn't the, um, the the Ministry of Foreign Culture it is. Translation the, Grant. The Books in Italy, that IT thing. Books in Italy is new, right? So there's yeah. a new web su website. Okay, Pretty so it's new. on there. Books oh, in Italy. I can't connect. Okay. Yeah, but That's it was fine. like we, we tried to apply for a grant for your book, and it would we didn't, couldn't get it because it wouldn't function, and it didn't. Yeah. It literally didn't work. <laughs> yeah. Like, and we had to call them, and they're like, "Well, there's nothing we can do." Then, yeah. blah blah. So, I mean, there were. <laughs> it, was, it was really discouraging. There's, there's one that, um, that. Um, um, yeah, there's applied for. Oh, it's a different one. Yeah, yeah, that got some funding, but it took two years um, for. Yeah. They accepted it two years after the book was published. So. Yeah, <laughs> there's so you much. There's a whole, the money this whole thing they cut. They cut this this addendum that I wrote. They cut it from the final proposal because it's just basically like all the things that are wrong on your website. There's two different due dates. There's two different places you're supposed to mail information. All of it's like literally factually inaccurate and not what they wanted. So they're like, we can't. That's the one. That's too embarrassing. Like everything else is fine, but this one's too embarrassing. But anyways. Well, I, I mean, I thought I'd talk about um, the first couple of books that uh, that I've had. Um, published that I translated in some ways they I think might reflect uh, partly what gets through not with big presses but with with smaller presses um, the first the first book I worked on is actually by a very famous writer in Italy um, Mario Brigoni Stern he's very well known um, his his uh, sergeant in the snow uh, sergeant in the neve um, was it's an international bestseller taught in the taught in the schools he comes out of um, the neorealist movement. He's a uh, he's since passed away, but he um, uh, he came out of neorealism. The book I translated was from the 1990s, and it won a prize. It um, is the uh, Stagione di Giacomo, Giacomo's Seasons. Um, Sergeant in the Snow was translated, and um, I I doubt it got very much attention um, when it was translated. I believe it was in the 1950s. And it was by the man who we were talking about last night, and we um, he's got a, a difficult name to pronounce. Archibald. Yes, Ar he's, it's by Archibald, uh, uh, maybe Calhoun. Uh, Let's say Calhoun. Cal yeah, Calhoun or something <laughs> like that. Um, and I have a feeling that part, I mean, he should have been up there with like Primo Levi, you know. He should have had, I think, that, that kind of attention, but maybe it's not as much of a grab because it's it's not Holocaust, you know. But but his work, it's um, it's very readable and very interesting. Um, but it was translated by very badly. That book was translated very badly, and it's been. Um, I hope I hope that guy is not living anymore. As I say this, that makes me feel bad for saying it. But but it really is. It's so stiff and unreadable. Um, and it, that would be a wonderful one, you know, to re. Um, to republish, it has actually that copy that um, that particular translation has been uh, republished. But um, I think that you know partly is based on on not being the best of translations that he didn't really get any attention um, uh, in the U.S. So the book that um, that I uh, translated, um, I love that book, and I think it really deserved um, a U.S. audience, an American audience, but. Um, it's not, it's very well written. It's between the world wars in Italy. I think it has very appealing subject matter. You know, I think partly it's the, the subject matter of what gets published in, in the U.S. I think it, you know, books tied to World War II. I think that that subject matter is interesting. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's not written from a more typical American you know, realistic, scenic kind of uh, novel. Um, it doesn't have the, you know, the sort of narrative arc of, you know, more <coughs> realistic. I mean, it is, of course, it's in this sort of neo-realist tradition, but it's told from the point of view of an entire community. Um, it has this very gentle voice that in some ways makes me think a little bit of some Calvino. It's just, it was just sort of on the edge so that I, I submitted it I'm kind of embarrassed about this, but I submitted it over a 10-year period to 50 different presses. 
Yeah, actually, I submitted it to 49, and then I had give, kind of given up. You know, it, this really, and um, actually, Chad, you turned it down at uh, Dalkey Archive, <laughs> but it didn't fit at Dalkey Archive, and you explained that. It was a very polite, and he's right, and so I was just learning, like, what matches where, and but I tried it at, you know, a lot of more standard American, just just presses and people liked it but they I don't know how to market it I don't know how to sell it because it just didn't quite fit you know it didn't even fit the sort of definition of int- what we wanted for international literature mm-hmm. and and it was finally um, published by a very small um, translation press Autumn Hill Russell Valentino's press um, and you know it hasn't gotten uh, a ton of attention but I hope it will continue to live and it's just a, a, it's such a beautiful book and um, a very moving book so I was really happy that you know that it found a home and so that was that was the first one what's funny is that that came out in 2014 would you say there were like 40 books in 2014 that, that came out yeah so yeah. so I have two of them which is so funny because one of them took me 10 years to you know to publish <laughs> the second one was with open letter and um, and that's Julia Mozzi's um, this is the garden which is a, um, a collection of short stories um and that one was, um, I mean, uh, another book that I just adored, very different, um, metafictional, uh, very spare prose, uh, I thought uh, very philosophical, yet also imagistic at, at the same time. And, um, and right away it started getting just a whole lot of reception, first from literary journals. Every story was published in a, you know, in a major, uh, Kenyan Review, Missouri, you know, they were published in all these great journals. And, and I submitted that as a query, again, still not entirely knowing what the presses are. I submitted it to Europa, but that's not the right place for, yeah. you know, it's just not the, it's not their cup of tea. And I would imagine maybe there'll be some discussion about what Italian books are actually being put forward. If the 20 of them are Europa, that's a very different you know, kind of book. I mean, this one, it has a blurb from, um, uh, from Minna Proctor who says, you know, he's, he's tied, he's in the tradition of Calvino and Tabuki. I mean, it's highly literary fiction. And he is known in Italy. He's not um, as Christina, sorry, Christina, I have to mention your name, but as Christina says, he's, he's known and he's respected as a literary writer, but he's a short story writer. He's not, you know, widely read in the, the general public, but he's highly um, respected. And that book um so it, it Europa wasn't interested but but the second press I sent it to was open letter and you know it took a while to to hear but you know so that was a, just a much a much different story with a uh, so it's the, you know these smaller presses that are interested in um in the more what you might say high art yeah. you know um literary text so I'll, I'll stop there and Pass it to me. Pass the batons, <laughs> the batons to you. Um, well, unlike Chad, I don't have any data, uh, <laughs> so I'm not sure. Um, I'm not sure exactly what to focus on. I, I, in a way, the things about transmission that interest me the most are the things that aren't quantifiable or. Um, that you can't put any numbers to, and, and that are kind of mysterious, like um, like for example, questions of um, untranslatability, uh, which cert- certain authors are sometimes said to be untranslatable, and, and that's sometimes offered as an explanation for why they don't make it across into other cultures. You know, this has been said a lot about Leopardi. Um, of course, now maybe it won't be said as much now that the Galassi's translation has done so well. Um, but uh, it was also said about a poet that I translate, uh, Giovanni Pascoli, who was late 19th, early 20th century Italian poet, who's a you know major, major figure in in Italian poetry. Um, you know, one of the foundational you know modern poets, a hugely influential figure, but doesn't really exist in English. I mean, there have been a few uh, translations of him, but they, none of them have gotten any traction. Um, he doesn't have a reputation in English. You ask people who know Ungaretti and Montale, and they don't—they've never heard of Pascoli. Um, so it's a mystery to me, you know, why writers like that get overlooked. While uh, you know, I think, and I think, you know, in Pascoli's case, I think it has to do with the fact that he was sort of his moment was the late 19th, early 20th century, which was not a particularly um, Exciting moment. I did, he wasn't part of any sort of literary movement with with a you know a catchy name. It was pre you know pre just pre futurism, 
pre um, you know modernism, um, and he sort of so he sort of falls between you know Leopardi and Montale or something in some sort of no man's land, um, and so that's that may be part of it. Is certain kinds of historical periods are, are um, catch uh, the imagination of, 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 of you know uh, other places and. Um, we have a place in our imaginations for futurists, and um, so, or we have a place in our imagination for for modernists like Montale and Ungaretti. But even there, you know, Umberto Saba, who is another great Italian poet on on a par with Montale and, and Ungaretti, is not nearly as well known as 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 those as Ungaretti and Montale here in this country. Um, again, it, it's just he's also been translated several times, but they haven't gotten that much traction compared to Montale and Ungaretti. So it's th those kinds of those kinds of things are mysterious to me. And um, um, and, there, and there's also another case, another poet that I translated uh, was Pavese. And I, I did his complete poems uh, for Copper Canyon. And he's, he's kind of almost the opposite case where he, he is better known in English as a poet and his poetry is, much, is, is, is fairly influential in, American, in the American context. You know, Philip Levine was hugely influenced by him. I've had a number of American poets tell me or write about how important Pavese was to them. And he's much more, um, his profile as a poet is much larger in this country than it is in Italy where he's considered primarily a novelist who also wrote some you know, popular poems near the end of his life, and so, you know, um, and so that's another strange disparity uh, in the other direction um, that I, I don't fully know how to explain. Um, in Pavese's case, it may have something to do with the fact that he was strongly influenced by American writers, and so maybe what Americans respond to in Pavese is a kind of echo of themselves, or something. Um, I'm not sure about that. Um, so there's. Um, there's that. Uh, another thing that interests me is a kind of maybe what might be called a literary myopia, where a tendency of the translation community to focus on contemporary works, and um, and if they re it, it, when they translate older works, it's it's they're always going back to the same older works and retranslating yeah. them, okay. so that you're not getting any you're not discovering any new voices uh, from you know if 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 the authors and and didn't and didn't make an impact and hasn't already made an impact in some way. Chances are they're not going to be you know uh, rediscovered at this point. You'll just uh, that's that's something that happens I think with Pasquale as well. You know he's uh, um, you know Leopardi at least always had some a, a sort of name recognition uh, somehow despite the fact that his poetry wasn't really available in in editions in English that anybody read, but uh, he was such a, a towering figure that somehow that um, um, al al allowed him to s sort of ha have a kind of traction even in the absence of translations. Uh, um, I don't know, I also, uh, my, my most recent uh, translation was a, an anthology, uh, which is the FSG book of 20th century Italian poetry, um, and so I, I, I was thinking a lot about some of these kinds of questions and um, as I edited that and I was very conscious that anthologies in a certain way are these vehicles that can determine who, who comes across because I, I had a chance to include a lot of poets who haven't been translated in, in book form um, mm -hmm. and so who are virtually unknown in English uh, but you know, it's my hope that by representing them with a, a you know a small selection of a few poems in an anthology, that they they will come to the attention of readers who might then go dig up more and and uh, translate books. So I think anthologies can be an important gateway, um, although anthologies themselves often, you know, uh, have trouble getting traction. You know, they're hard to they're from a publishing standpoint, they're extremely hard to do. The permissions are absurd, and um, and. There's no good reason for any right-minded person to make an anthology. <laughs> um, so uh, anyway, I, I'll stop there, and I'll be happy to answer questions about any of those things. So. Um, my name is Diana Thao, and I, um, I've translated um, for a number of years an Italian poet who has gone from being pretty much untranslated in the States to being pretty recognized, um, Amelia Rosselli. 
and um, I started working on her um, as a suggestion from a professor from from Larry Venuti actually um, and and I'm interested how translators because hearing Chad talk it makes me think that um, especially poetry but I think also with prose and, and hearing Elizabeth Liz as well um, I feel like this is such an idiosyncratic choice you know it's based on what translators are interested in translating and if they have the time and energy to then get it published um, and the means um, and so it seems an interesting question how how these choices are made um, and for me they were made or, or suggested in the university um, you know I studied Italian in college I studied abroad in Rome um, and now as a PhD student in Italian studies in Complit, um, trying to teach these things to um, non-Italian speakers that I'm interested in, you know, teaching um, fiction, Leopardi, whatever, um, it seems to form how I shape my syllabus and how I shape um, what discussions I'm having with um, my colleagues um, who are not in Italian studies. So. I'm, I'm interested in the role also that the university or, or other um, resources are playing in sort of giving translators ideas of what to translate, um, what needs to be translated, what hasn't been translated, what's been translated well or poorly. Um, but with Rosselli, I, um, I started just because I, I was fascinated by her and she's one of these poets who's sort of between languages because she had multiple languages and she was as a female poet who was sort of an anomaly in the Italian male landscape of 20th century poetics. I was drawn to her as well um, and it's just been a really interesting um, passage between yeah her being virtually unknown to having mostly all of her books translated um, and, and sort of sort of having conversations suddenly with people who are poets who don't speak Italian come up to me and say, I love Rosselli, like, it's amazing that you do that work. Um, and yeah, so I, I'm, I'm interested in hearing how people, like how people find the projects that they find and, um, and how we can sort of bolster that network. Um, because as Choi Chad pointed out, like on the other side of things, it's a, it's, it's a jungle out there in terms of, finding Italian publishers or agents or whatever that are going to help us. Mm. Um, and actually, Jamie, you can probably speak to this a lot, too. Um, so I was interested in, in talking about that. And then also um, a phenomenon that's, that's sort of complementary but interesting in um, female writing, um, Italian women's writing in the States, has a huge um, interest, popularity, success. In, um, in a way that I think it's starting to in Italy, um, but so the idea of women's studies kind of doesn't exist in the same way in the United in Italy as it does in the United States, um, and so I feel like uh, again you know scholars who have come from Italy to the States to study you know feminist literature or feminist theory, um, women's writing are then um, translating this stuff. Um, Paolo Mazzino is a great example, um, Rosselli, people who are um, maybe even, you know, Italian scholars um, or, or, you know, native Italians who come to the United States because they want to pursue this line of, of study. Um, so that seems to be an interesting phenomenon where now, and, and I think Ferrante is actually one of those things too. I think in, the, in Italy people are like, Ferrante is great, but you know, what, what's the big deal? Um, I mean, maybe I'm speaking out of turn, people can correct me. Um, <laughs> but um, again, it seems to be that the US is particularly receptive to female Italian voices in a way that's been um, kind of exciting and maybe a, a counterpoint to the sort of negativity of like, oh, we can't get anything published, there's only you know four books in translation or whatever. Um, uh, of poetry, fourteen um, published in a year. Um, so, so I wanted to throw that into the mix too, and I'd be ha I'd be really curious to hear of people in the audience who want to chime in as well. And then I have more questions for people, but maybe we can just open it up. Okay, thank you guys. Should we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so. Thank you for bringing up all of those um, examples. Does anyone have questions? I, 
I can start with um, some general issues because two of the things that really come out for me are the difference between publication and readership. So um, yeah. there's the struggle to get published mm -hmm. and then what happens after you get published and how much of that is a matter of money and financing um, or not, right? So that's, um, I don't know if you guys have um, comments, <laughs> if anyone has comments about that, about um, public publishing something and then getting readers, how, where, or how, how does that work? I don't know. It's it's it's, it's mysterious <laughs> to me. It's, again, it's mysterious to me. Um, what you, you never know what's going to get traction and why um, when it's published. You get something published like like uh, and it, like the Ferrante, and it takes off in a way that was unex quite unexpected, I'm sure, to the to the publisher. And um, and other times, you things that you might expect to do better don't do so well and it's not necessarily a factor it has something to do with what kind of press is behind them but it, that's not always predictable either you know uh, um, it, uh, yeah it's absolutely not and the fronte is um is an interesting because it, it did take a long time i mean the uh days of abandonment came out in 2003 maybe mm -hmm. something so. like that um and that did well I, enough, I think. There was like a literary following as people I knew read it and liked it and had talked about it. And then there was um, The Lost Daughter, I think is the second one, or then there's a third one, and then the Neapolitan Quartet, which was the first ones that actually were very successful sales-wise. So it did take some, I mean, it wasn't like she just automatically caught on. So there was there had to be that perseverance. But um, yeah, it's, it, you, you never know what's going to work. But I do think that it's, it, there's something strange, and I'll try and I'll try to articulate this, and it'll probably come out all wrong, but might generate part of a conversation <laughs> about this. There's a few. I remembered as we were talking that about five years ago, someone contacted me to get information from the database about Italian specifically because there was some. I think it was the AP courses or the AP tests for high school students in Italian had been eliminated, and they're talking about like different foreign languages that had been cut back on in high school students. And Italian was like the main one that was like a lot of the programs are being shut down or just weren't being offered um, for a pub for publishing with French and German and Spanish. There is not so much German, but for French and Spanish in particular, there's so many people in high schools and students that are learning that. Like my kids are learning Spanish and French. Like they, they but they don't even. I don't think they have Italian offered in the least. And in some ways, that does make a difference for your audience because you're familiar with the culture to some degree or with like ideas of it. It's romanticized in these courses they, in high school, like all the, the different foods, the different things that go along with that country's language. Um, and then when you go to read a book about it or read a book from a French author, some of that's kind of implanted. You already have certain projections towards it. With Italian literature, that's not as clear cut. If there's not the, um, the, the that sort of language training, I don't know what 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 I don't I wouldn't know what like my kids would think of Italy or like what their preconceived notions are. So what kind of fiction would they want? How would you market it to them? That's that becomes a little bit trickier. Geronimo Stilton. That's what they know. That's literally that's it. Geronimo Stilton. Um, and <laughs> and that's fine. The most successful Italian author next to Fronte probably or char character at least. Um, but there's also so related to that with the editors with. Pub with people working in publishing, there aren't a lot that I know that speak Italian either. I mean, aside from Europa editions. Um, well, you might know Glossy. Glossy, of there. course, and that's why they do so many, yeah. why they're like right up there. I mean, there's people who are, who are into that that tended to, to help promote those books. Um, but there is something too about like the the tradition. Like you mentioned, a ton of the the poets and like there is this very rich tradition of Italian literature. But there's so many gaps, I think, in English that it's hard to like place things in a way that's not as difficult if you look at French or German because a lot of the the main the the hundred best writers of the past hundred years, a lot of those are available in English. So when you come to someone new or go back to someone that had previously been overlooked, it's easy to like kind of formulate. And for a publishing perspective, that's helpful editorial-wise, but also in marketing, that you can start to figure out how you're going to pitch this. Um, the fact that most of the Italian books that come out are like noir does influence mm -hmm. and does 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 shade, shade that a little bit, that that's the thing that we're most familiar with. Calvino, Umberto Eco, noir, Ferrante. That's, mm -hmm. that's the, the main, and Geronimo Stilton. And Dante, yeah. And Dante. Oh, yeah, don't forget Dante. Yeah, and, 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 yeah. Of contemporary, modern, modern things, but yeah. But I don't have a comment or a question. It's just a thought. Yeah. I have a question about the. Well, first, let me just say thank you for your database. Oh no problem. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I'm curious about this discrepancy in publishing between fiction and poetry, and and I'm wondering if that is reflective of the climate here in the U.S. Or the climate in Italy, or a combination of the two. So, in other words, kind of how does poetry fare? How do you compare Italy versus the U.S. in that matrix, or try and account for that? 
I was curious in terms of the numbers, like if that, that percentage sort of mapped out onto others in terms of what gets. It's probably pretty close, to be yeah. honest. Poetry, um, yeah. For like twenty, let's just do. Right? Just yeah. I have a question about that so as well. Are there any presses that maybe? don't get considered because there are a few Italian like there are a few micro presses that publish a lot of Italian poetry that I, I don't know if they as have any distribution right. not a lot but that publish only Italian yeah. poetry um who are you thinking of it seems like Chelsea was on that list but yeah yeah Sheet Meadow published that Sheet Meadow is on here yeah Sartorelli yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. but it is it's quite small yeah there is just to put it in the whoops ah there we go um, so in 2014, which is like probably the most reliable of the, the most recent year's data, because 2015 is still ongoing, there was 498 works of fiction and 98 poetry. So it's basically a, a mm -hmm. five to one ratio. Mm -hmm. um, so it's a little bit, a little bit extreme for uh, Italian, but not not that much. That's actually yeah. got to be a better ratio than, than the, the culture at large in yeah. the U.S., oh, yeah. right? I mean, right. in terms it of fiction versus ratio. poetry, uh, <laughs> it's actually better. And the vast majority of the poetry books are coming out from. I mean, there's there's the FSGs, the Yale that pops up here, but a lot of them are the micro presses that you're talking about that do three, four books a year, and their distribution goes through SPD or through somewhere that's like um, not necessarily the most active sales force um, that's out there. But they do exist, and they find their audience. Well enough, and like you on the best translated book award for uh, yeah, Italian that translation that poetry, nice. yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that helps. A but bit. I wanted to say um, maybe this is getting off topic, and we can get back to your question if, if you still have um, questions. But um, what you mentioned, or what Jamie mentioned at the beginning about Italian being, it's still a Western language. It's still like publishing houses seem to want like more. I don't know, like sexier, not like. I mean, I guess Italian's pretty sexy, but like, um, like <laughs> not main, mainstream languages, right? And so I found that, like, submitting to places, it's like, well, you know, an Italian poet, that's not, that's not news, you know? That's not something, yeah. we already have Montale, we already have um, Ferrante or whatever. Um, and so there seems to be, like, Italians between a rock and a hard place in publishing, and mm -hmm. that it's both... Um, you know, not as as popular um, to publish, and yet there is, you know, I don't know, like all this allure and, and attraction that's um, being generated culturally. I don't know. It just seems like a, an interesting paradox. I've been, um, I've been getting. Um, I mean, I feel like it's just uh, it, in some ways talking to the to the right presses. You know, so the small um, international lit presses. I mean, I think they want to do more like two lines is in communication they really want to do more especially especially women but but yeah. definitely italian and an archipelago is right now just you know putting out uh tabuki and more and and one who who is who's major who has he's not known at all is antonio moresco i mean he's he's huge, he's huge. and he's he's just one book now at um archipelago but you know um so so uh, i mean she uh, jill schoolman at, at archipelago is wanting to grow her list, if I can put it that way. That's promising. I think you might be too. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> Other questions? I think something that came up um, in your comments right now and as well as before um, is just the more general question of how do we measure success? Um, because one of the really concrete things we can focus on are numbers and data or numbers of what get, gets published, but how do you really measure? And even as a mm -hmm. translator, like you feel like this book did well or well enough for you, mm -hmm. sales data, some kind of other interaction reviews, how, does, how do we measure success or failure, I guess? Huh. Yeah, I mean, reviews, I reviews is a huge factor. And I mean, um, like the best... The most successful book I've ever done in terms of reviews and just general attention and probably also sales was the Pabese book that Copper Canyon did um, in 2002 now and um, and that got reviewed um, you know all over the place all over the world in fact and um, and a book that I thought was going to do better was that the FSG anthology which um, came out in 2012 and with you know the backing of a, a great publishing house and Jonathan Glassy is a, a, great, a great editor who had a stake in that mm -hmm. book and and that just did not do uh, that well and and then you start trying to figure out why and 
you think, well, the cover price was 50 bucks. That's probably a big part of it. You know, it's it's just it's an expensive book, and um, and part of the reason it's it costs so much is because it was a bilingual edition, which doubles the size of it, and also doubles the cost of it. And then you start second guessing that kind of decision. You know, well, you know, maybe it would have done a lot better if it had, if it hadn't been bilingual. Um, also, you know, then you start looking at cover designs and things like, oh, that was a, you know, uh, so uh, it's the cover's fault. And so. The paperback just came out now. The paperback just came out finally, um, and the price is what is it? Cut in 30 half, or something. 25, yeah. I'd be interested to see if that gets adopted more in classrooms and becomes yeah. more... It'll certainly... Well, I know a ton of people who want to teach it. Yeah. I think yeah. they just, I don't know why they didn't buy it except for the price. <laughs> 50 bucks, yeah. Uh, yeah you can't, you can't mean, make I, your shoes buy a $50 yeah. buck. Yeah, it's hard <laughs> to, it's hard to justify it. that. Yeah. Anyway, so, uh, yeah, and, the, and the, whereas the Pavese just came out only in paperback. Right. Um, it was 20, 20 bucks to start with, you know, and never, um, you never had that, that barrier to entry. Yeah. Um, so, but yeah, I mean, I, I, and I don't even follow the no sales numbers so much, but, I, yeah. but it's the reviews, for me at least, the number of reviews that, that, indicate whether it's successful or not. I would feel like that's a better, I mean, it's not that's not as quantifiable, but a better metric of looking and judging success would be in, in the reviews or in the mentions and the way that the name enters into like the literary culture, or what we used yesterday, the literary ecosystem, the way that people are then referred to or know that author, seems much better. The sales are always going to be bad. <laughs> like sales, <Small>. sales, for, <laughs> sales for most books are bad, like unfortunately, <laughs> um, and you know, depressingly so. Um, they did have me on this thing. They wanted to know if Italian books sold better or worse than French and German books. So I chose randomly 10 books from each country and got like the book scan numbers for them. And out of those, there are only two out of all 30 that sold more than a thousand copies. So what? it wasn't, were yeah. They, it was, were they both Ferrante? No, no, it was no. I left her off intentionally because oh, okay. I wanted to rig it. Um, so I cheated. Um, but they were. Um, it was one was that the truth of the Harry Quibert affair or whatever it was the, the French book that came out uh, a couple of years ago that they paid a million dollars for as they advanced oh which God. is why wow. it was everywhere and then the other was a Jean Echenos novel um, which was weird but it was like just over a thousand copies but yeah so the sales things are always going to make you sad I think um, I think the more of the getting into the cultural that that that's more important in the long run is like having those conversations and having the impact of the book because there is a lot of stuff that we said too for like um like we the in publishers publishers will always focus on the sales numbers or talk about it because it's the way that you have to survive and a lot of judgments are made upon whether or not a book has the possibility of selling enough copies or not um, at the same time, and this is why translations in some ways get frowned upon because they don't sell as, as easily as an American author who tours and knows everyone. You sell more copies of their book, whatever. But um, at the same time, those, those translations or those books that might not sell a lot of copies at the start tend to have a really high influence. Like there's a bigger impact sometimes where like the books that we most cherish are books that, that may not have sold all that well but are very important to us. So there has to be some other way of evaluating this or talking about it where it's like this, is, this was a very important book and had this great influence even though it sold 400 copies. question um, based on Steven Snyder's um, keynote talk um, a couple days ago when he was talking about how um, Murakami or how um, Japan after the war was there was the image was sort of curated by the New Yorker and um, other other institutions powers that be and I was just wondering what how the Italian question sort of maps onto that like so, you know, in terms of politics, like a similar sort of transition from um, enemy to, um, you know, Fellini and, you know, the Dolce Vita or whatever. Um, and, and if you guys had any thoughts about if that plays, so you're talking about the cultural capital, like, um, like what, is, what is Italian literature's cultural capital and how do we measure it or how, do, how have we measured it? Um, starting with post-war, I don't know if this is a question, and I'll open it up to the audience too, I'm sure the people here can, um, who have thoughts about that, but um, yeah, following Steven Snyder is sort of shaping. I thought that was, his thing was really interesting to me too, where you, what you're talking about with like, the um, in the 60s especially, where it's like everything's peaceful, zen-like yeah, right. instead of, yeah, yeah was, I don't know how that, I mean the things that I would think are like, um, a lot of like the more like film, Italian film be very, very, I mean, important in one of the things that kind of sort of breaks through, but also seems sort of 
um, European in that like heavy, important, modernist sense. Um, but then with fiction, yeah, it doesn't seem like I have it's a, not like a clear I have a quote here. from uh, from Tim Parks. Remember, he mentioned Tim Parks's, yeah, yeah. and so I um, I have a. It's he's fun to read. Tim Parks, who um, I, I have to say this because he. So he, he writes um, himself, and, um, and he stops translating, and I, I really enjoyed this. So he talks about um, that there are um, antithetical qualities for translators. They have to be very respectful and at the same time dominating. And that, um, and that for me, it always required such an effort of suppression of my own desires to do things, and at the end, it was just too much like giving blood. And so that's why, <laughs> that's why he stopped translating. But he had this to say about um, about contemporary Italian novels. He says, I must say there are really not many contemporary or very recent Italian novels that I love in the way I love um, these books here. He's talking about uh, Verga, Bassani, um, uh, you know, some just some real classic books. There have been some very fine novels of the last 20 years, but I remember when I read for the Campiello Prize, and that's what uh, Rigoni Stern's book won, one of the big Italian literary prizes seven or eight years ago, I did feel terribly disappointed at the 70 or 80 books that I was reading on that occasion. I think this is a very difficult moment in Italian fiction. I think that one of the things that's happening is that writers are less and less writing out of the Italian tradition and more and more writing towards a new international tradition. So, you know, working no. towards smoothing smoothing it out and I mean I think that that is I mean I hate to make big claims because I just don't feel like I know anything but it does it does seem like um, there's like different strands of you know of Italian right and, and then some are definitely um, more TV like more I hate to say it, more of that sort of American scene by scene but you know less of the fil- the philosophical I mean that's definitely a you know a, a tendency but um, but then there are the, there are plenty of amazing writers, you know, who are who are much more specifically Italian, but they're just not not getting, um, you know, put forward. That's something I was alluding to. That sort of idea is really pervasive. That it's all crap. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or a lot of Italian writers who maybe don't read that much Italian fiction themselves, or you know, say, oh, you know, there's nothing good. And there's this idea that's kind of exaggerated. I think. I think so too. It's perception. Yeah. 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 I mean, I just that there's. I was just looking through, you know, writers who would be wonderful to translate. I mean, there's so many of them. Oh yeah, I just wanted to try to follow up on Diana's question for a minute because I think it's really interesting. Um, where yeah, where Italy is in the kind of cultural perception, and I think I'm probably about to lead into a bunch of wrong stereotypes. <laughs> Okay. I'm just going to try it out. Um, as I think about those differences between the French and German mm-hmm. um, and Spanish translations, I think what you said about the just what you're exposed to in high school certainly has to do with it. But as I think about the kind of classic American attitude towards Italy, um, we go there in a very capitalist way to consume um, culture, but kind of like the eating, drinking, like yep. teach us how to go slow mm-hmm. and yeah. life yeah. culture. Mm-hmm. Whereas I think, um, and you know, they, because um, they badly need the money, are willing to sort of market themselves along those lines as well. Whereas I think, you know, for instance, France still has a stake in saying, um, we're more intellectual than you can ever imagine. You've got Americans <laughs> and read these heavy books or something. Um, so that there's a strange way in which um, we don't turn towards Italy intellectually the way we turn towards other parts of Europe, um, which maybe also has to do with these gaps that uh, Jennifer was alluding to. You know, there's no kind of um, continuous, continuous tradition of literature to. <laughs> My question sort of dovetails to her and, and thinking about this. To me, the question isn't necessarily what, what stereotypes Americans have of these places, but how do these folks see themselves in the literary thing? So, so France is the Amazon jungle ecology, and German is the Malaysian, lots of stuff going on. So how, does, how do Italian readers writers think of themselves and do they feel like they're in a rich period and uh, the problem with um, 
the other two countries, their, their governments help. Yeah. And in this case, it seems like the Italians don't. So yeah. is there a up push from the writers or the enthusiasm in the culture for what is being written, talked about, or films? Mm -hmm. And maybe somewhere in there, our editors, our readers are sort of thinking, well, we don't hear much about them. It's not a jungle with lots of stuff in it. Something's happened. I'm just wondering what you know about the own self-perception of the reading uh, I mean, I think there'll, citizen. There's probably different impressions from, I mean, my, my own impression is from, from the writers that I know. And um, I think that there's a, you know, with at least one of them, um, a, a, it's very uh, intense. There's actually a lot of, of readings and small presses, at, but um, but a frustration of not being able to to break into the the larger publishing houses that he you know he feels are um, you know very politically run. And yes, he does refer to them as the mafiosi, and you know. But um, so I mean, I think that there's actually a very rich um, group of writers that you know. There's a lot that's going on, but. But some, but frustration. I don't know about your impressions from others. I think so. Yeah, I would agree. Yeah, that there's a sort of, it's almost the opposite problem in Italy in that it seems like there's a cultural dominance of the publishing houses and the powers that be and the prizes that dictate so much of what gets published and and why. Um, that yeah, the the sort of smaller presses seem to be cropping up now a lot more, and there's a lot more excitement around, you know little publishing houses and smaller, but there is a frustration of feeling trapped, I guess. Um, but how the general reader sort of approaches that problem, I'm not, I have the impression that Italians read a ton um, compared to the United States, but again, I'm making generalizations. Um, sure. But yeah, that the average person will, yeah, maybe yeah, Christine. Maybe what happens in Italy is the other way around. So we translate like 75% of our literature. Right. So we're very much esterophily. <laughs> and that must create a huge gap in readership, right? If the yeah. Italian readers aren't reading Italian writing, and then it's not getting translated, there's this sense of, who, what, what am I writing, and who's, who's it getting to? Mm -hmm. But what I think is also interesting is that, for instance, Ferrante, I would never have thought she would be translatable. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, I'm from the north of Italy, and I honestly, there's so many things she tells about which are weird to me. Mm -hmm. Although I know where to put them historically, but I don't know where to put my culture for it. Yeah. So I, I never would have thought that internationally somebody would read about that. Mm -hmm. right? And that brings up another problem that, uh, or interesting question that hasn't that we haven't talked too much about, but which is like regionalisms and dialect. Because I think there isn't, unlike the French and German, there yeah. isn't this sort of like monolith um, institution that's dictating what Italian Italianita is. Um, and by necessity, like after fascism or whatever, you know, it's like the opposite even. Um, so that the, the, the landscape seems very fragmented and, and necessarily so. Um, so there isn't, it's hard for um, a translator from the US to put their finger on this is what the next hot thing is going to be or like if that's what they're looking for. Interesting. You mentioned uh, the phenomenon. Sure. I don't know if anyone has translated anybody. Um, so, right, migrant writing is this kind of general term, right, referring to um, writers who write in Italian as a second language or um, of another ethnicity. Um, sort of the wave of migration has been sweeping Italy. And um, I think that sometimes those writers might not fit in in English because they're Italian, they have no like claim to Italianness in the same way. Um, so, and a lot of their works actually are speaking really directly to an Italian audience, or like, hello, I exist, because mm -hmm. part of it is about trying to integrate into mm -hmm. literary culture, but also socially. Um, and I translated um, a book by Nicola Lilin, who is um, a Transnistrian writer. Uh, I mean, he writes in Italian. He's Transnistrian, which is this breakaway country from the former Soviet Union. Um, and it's about fighting in Chechnya. And there's 
nothing Italian about it other than the language. So it's very easy for that to be, um, in fact, there are a few <coughs> instances of books where you wouldn't know it's Italian. Like, um, and so, and I think maybe in other cases, those writers don't get, maybe there's not a place for them in English, I don't know. Well, I, I, because we've already solved our migration problem. Right but but I mean, there are some. I, I think that there might be actually some room for um, you know considering the, the 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 world consideration of. I think that there's room for these for some of these writers who you know who have this experience. Um, that there's a there's a there's an anthology I was taking a look at called. Um, um, Pecre Nero that has a bunch of um, you know if you're interested in, in finding writers to, to translate I mean there's a there's a lot of I think interesting um, immigrant writers um, one who has just got a book out is um, uh, Ijibo uh, Shego mm-hmm. Ethiopian you know Ethiopian. I think it's Ethiopian right who, Somali of Somali again she, she was born in born in Italy yeah and her her writing is very is very interesting so you know there's a there's a number of them. Um, seems like that might be a wave of and I think would touch actually American audiences I think that's something that's a great consideration worldwide you I know think some of those have been published by small presses and there are a couple yes, of anthologies very small yeah um, and they're translated also by academics who are primarily academics and not translators which is another issue um, of the quality of the translations um, and the yeah. sort of priorities or interests or technique um, approach of an academic translator as opposed to a more literary translator. Not that we can totally make that distinction, but um, sometimes people who don't translate regularly or professionally or extensively translate differently or not as well, maybe, um, in or some cases. So some of those things, and there are, there are these little um, university presses, so very low distribution and maybe for use in university courses, I would think, mm-hmm. uh, for course adoptions. So. I do have a question for you. So, um, So I, I would say, do you see any cool factory? <laughs> yes. <laughs> well, all of all of us do here because that's that's why we <laughs> translate Italian. But uh, absolutely, I yeah, absolutely. Right, but I mean, um, oh, what is yeah. it? Like, mm-hmm. uh, what is it? What's the? Are, are you talking about in the literature, or are you yeah, talking about just in general? I mean, to to me, it's the it, the the very cool is how uh, philosophy um, it intertwines with with story. How much hmm. how how much of that there is in the in the fiction that I, that I've picked to translate. I just love it. Mm-hmm. I think that's cool. <laughs> <laughs> and maybe the plurality of dialect, like the regionalisms, right. like that's such a foreign concept. Um, for pretty much everyone, right? Like how the Italian states, you know, sort of independently um, became their their own places. I think that's really sort of I don't know appealing and seductive, and it's and cool for me. Yeah, I, I don't I don't um, I think you're asking about sort of in a broader cultural sense would would Americans think uh, have that attitude toward Italian literature and. And I'm not sure about that. I mean, uh, I mean, I think for one thing, a, a lot of the cool factor does tend to follow, for better and for worse. You know, there are good things about this, but tends to follow sort of political hotspots or things that are yeah, happening around true, the yeah. world that are in the news, and and those then, the literatures of places that are in the news then becomes kind of cool or kind of of, of interest, yeah. you know, um, in a, in a in a to to, to us, and and so. You know, Italy has not uh, not been much in the news lately, which yeah. is probably good. Financial collapse. Financial collapse. Financial well, and also, and also yeah, immigrant, not, not well. immigrant considerations, immigrant, yeah. right? Definitely. But even that doesn't get doesn't. Yeah, it pales. Yeah. In comparison to. Yeah. yeah. I think also some of the maybe the current fascination with Italy literature is as with
Charles um, takes on this. So in terms of, um, you know, we could talk about Italian literature that's like uh, um, regional or, you know, presenting people with like, you know, ears, like, uh, in, uh, you know, a little spot of the world that or culture that you're unfamiliar with. And then there's Italian writers who maybe, you know, see they're in conversation with the world and are interested in philosophy and, you know, just the same way there's, you know, American and French and German writers who, um, and so do you think that there's one more than the other that um, people want to feed that seem to, you know, take off in America or uh, some of one, some of the other? I think something kind of notable is that um, some of the main genres that are almost translated noir, mm -hmm. not really, I think, anything, something that any of us has really worked with or is super interested in. So there's that, too. Um, there's, and that, that's probably going to come back around, too, because, like, like the, right now there's a lot of focus on, like, Scandinavian noir, but it'll, it'll shift back to, like, Italian. Um, I mean, there still is a ton of them that are coming out, but, like, I think a lot of the, the general reader that goes to their public library and checks out the new book that's a mystery um, they're doing a lot of like Scandinavian stuff now and they'll probably rotate back around at some point. But that is like a huge, and that's a big, big part of like what gets translated from Italy. And it has a kind of effect on how. Yeah, 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 all the Camilleris yeah. are coming out. Yeah. So, uh, I think yeah. that has to do with the question of the image of Italy and the cool mm -hmm. factor because um, I think the, the mafia, mafia is, cool. is really is yeah. sort of, is, is a little bit that. And if not, I think um, the South is dominant in yeah. the American image of That's Italy right. in general. So, you know, Naples has a certain resident resonance that I think is like, you know, works um, and things like that. I would say more than the North. Um, so, I don't know, yeah. in terms of broader, broader regional sense. Yeah. Any last questions? <laughs> I want to ask one question. Do you guys have any recommendations? Because what um, was sort of behind this panel is like, what is getting ignored? So does anyone have yeah. anything that they'd like to say? You guys should check this out. Yeah, Antonio Moresco. But the um, the trilogy of, of you know, Leo Sordi. And you said Archipelago is publishing something of his? Yes. Um, um, one is coming out, but it's a later book, and it's more of these sort of archipelago taste. It's this sort of whimsical. The... <laughs> The title, oh, do you remember the title? It's one of, the, yeah, La Lucina. Yeah, yeah, that one's just coming out. But I mean, but that trilogy is really some of the best big books. That's a thousand page thing yeah, you that's, guys have talked to me about, right? Yeah. I, I might know how to get that funded. But. <laughs> yeah, others? And, uh, I, I don't know, I'm blanking now that you've asked the question. <laughs> I was going to say, Java Shego, I'm, um, Oh, hopefully going to translate one of her chapters of um, La Mia Casa Dove Sono, which I think actually inspired Adwa, the mm -hmm. new novel. Which is being translated. I hope so. It yeah. is being translated. Oh, I contacted her and she's, she says it's being translated. Oh, great. I mean, yeah. she's just wonderful. She's such a clear writer and I feel like really accessible, mm -hmm. like a beautiful person. Like, she's just incredible. Uh, something actually I want to mention, sorry, this isn't... Um, but just to throw in the mix, um, Jhumpa Lahiri just published a book of um, essays written in Italian. Um, she lived in Italy for two years, I huh. think, and said um, that she always felt a deep affinity with the language. Um, and that's just blows my mind and mm. is amazing. Um, so yeah, that's I think that's going to get published in a heartbeat. But um, yeah. It would be interesting, an interesting phenomenon if there were more American writers who, you know, live the dream and move to Italy or whatever and then, you know, start writing in, in Italian. So that oh. would be a built in. One, one book I would recommend is um, translated into English recently. It was uh, Selected Poems of Patrizia Cavalli, mm -hmm. which came out from FSG mm -hmm. a couple of years ago and is a wonderful, wonderful book. Okay, and Antonella and Nessa, but people are publishing mm -hmm. her. Does she have a book out? Uh, book out? Oh, we put Annette, I put Annette. Down. She's in my, the anthology, of course, but. Yeah, uh, I, but as like a full. Yeah, I don't know if there's a book. Put her on the list. Anyone else? Does anyone else have any other recommendations? I know some of you are Italian, Italianists. My big one, I think, is. Yeah.
There's, I think there, the are, there are a couple of translations of, yeah. of some of that Poesia Visiva uh -huh. and. Uh, um, yeah. Mm. Oh yeah, Paul Vangelisti's press. Um, Verso has published some of his um, stuff. Mm. Yeah. I think the sixties are a big gap in the neo-avant garde, mm. and um, a lot of those are a huge gap. And even some of that fiction, I tried to. Were you going to say Sanguinetti? Oh, Sanguinetti is another. Mm. Is Someone um, just got a, a pen grant yeah. to cool. do to do a collected works. I think of uh, Eduardo Sanguinetti. Yeah, so he's one. He's one. That will come out eventually, I think. I think Walter That's been, that's been translated. Yeah, yeah. that and came out a couple years ago. Yeah. That's a huge book. Yeah. Okay. What were you gonna, Jamie, did you want to? Oh, well, um, one that came to my mind is um, The Birth and Death of the Housewife, which we were talking about, uh, Paola Mazzino. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of writers who sort of might be considered modernist, mm -hmm. but aren't really categorized as such, um, don't have very much attention in, yeah. in English, I think. Mm -hmm. And that book is really great. And I think a feminist pre or someone, I forget um, who published it, but that's a really amazing book, Birth and Death of the Housewife. Mm -hmm. Bad title. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, guys. Thank you. Yay.